We've been talking a lot about um, cells and um, the, the impact on humans and on the DNA project, but um, we haven't really addressed the ecosystems and the, the biology of the world and what, what we're seeing happening, for example, with some of the mass extinctions that we're seeing. And so I'm so pleased that conservation biologist Pierre Comazzoli is here to um, talk to us about some of those things and some of his incredible research. Um, he works with um, what are often called the charismatic species, um, the big cats, uh, the panda bears, and actually um, uh, working with um, helping those those animals to remain here on the planet, which is just incredible work. And I had the pleasure of, uh, ha uh, Pierre was generous enough to do a, a long interview with me about his research, so which is incredibly fascinating. And then we, um, participated together at the Smithsonian uh, on a um, public forum about whether or not uh, we should genetically engineer the mosquito, uh, which was really fascinating. So I'm so pleased to introduce Pierre Comazzoli from Smithsonian. But I don't have a computer. <laughs> Is that the computer? Where is the IT guy? Now this is because of Alison. I just uh, modified the setup, so. OK. Well, first of all, uh, before we get the, the slides, thank you so much for inviting me, because uh, um, OK, I'm going to feel a little bit. I'm going to talk about myself. Okay, so um, I work as a research veterinarian at the Conservation Biology Institute at the Smithsonian. Uh, that's 50% of my time, and um, as you will see, I, I do some research on uh, conservation biology and animal conservation. But uh, I also work as a science advisor to the, to the provost of the Smithsonian, and I get really to explore uh, the different facets of the Smithsonian. As you know, the Smithsonian is really a, a large institution, and we, we try uh, to, to bridge really uh, art and science. So to me, being here, it's, uh, it ha it's really important because uh, I'm meeting really interesting people, and I hope that um, we can stay in touch and do more work uh, together. So, uh, the title of my presentation is a little bit uh, pretentious because, uh, wow, the future of conservation biology. Uh, this is my point of view uh, that I share, I can tell you, with other people. But, uh, you know, Meinungen sind geteilt, and uh, probably other people can really also think of a different future for conservation biology. But the key is really the, the, the subtitle. It's really trying to, to understand and to sustain biodiversity on a changing planet. And this is already a challenge to try to understand and to sustain biodiversity, but on the, on the top of that, we know that everything is changing all the time. So this is kind of uh, uh, an interesting representation of uh, uh, our planet, the evolution uh, over the past um, centuries, showing how really the presence of human has modified and, and shaped the, 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 the planet. And uh, you can see that uh, a lot of changes happened over the past maybe 200 years, starting with the Industrial Revolution. And then after that, you have those more like uh, futuristic views. Um, but uh, for sure, uh, now we can assert that we are entered in this Anthropocene, which is really the planet at the age of humans. So when I talk about uh, understanding and sustaining biodiverse planet, so first of all, we need to understand, you know, how biologically diverse is our planet. And don't forget that it's not only what you see at the surface that's really diverse, but also the soil. Soil biodiversity is extremely important because it conditions really the diversity that you see at the surface. 
Then, uh, well, evolution of life, of course. We need to understand that, and we talked a little bit about that uh, this morning. But then, understanding is not enough. We need to be able also to make sure that we ensure that the survival of the ecosystems, the habitats, and the entire species. And as I explained also before, is that how can we try, knowing that there are some changes, most of the changes now are related to human activities, but there are also cyclic, cyclical changes, and we need to understand that to better forecast those uh, changes and to try to, 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 uh, to be a little bit pro proactive. So why do we do that, by the way? Why do we want, do we want I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, why is it so important to have functioning ecosystem? Because it's not only the ecosystem, it's really a functional uh, ecosystem that's really important for us. As you can see on the top, it's a source of income for a lot of people. Um, then after that, of course, it's a source of food, water, and that's kind of uh, a little bit obvious, but also what's really important for people living on a coastal area, it's really, uh, it's a shelter. And it's really important, for example, to have, you know, coral reef to make sure that uh, people are not, are not going to be wiped out by tsunamis, for example. And something that's been explored, you know, for centuries also until the, for, for a long time, it's a, it's a source of medicine. And, Right now, still a vast majority of the drugs uh, for pres prescription drugs are really derived from, uh, from plants. And of course, and this is kind of the theme of this uh, symposium, having a functional, a beautiful ecosystem, you know, it's a source of recreation, happiness, well-being, and of course, for you guys, the artists, it's a great source of uh, inspiration. So when I was talking about, you know, health, and it's not only medicine, it's, uh, it, we need to consider about, you know, the, 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 the concept of health uh, in a really broad sense. It's not only the absence of pathogen, but it's also psychological health. And uh, we live, you know, in a planet where we share a lot of uh, goals between humans and animals. We want babies, not only cute babies, but we want them also to be healthy. And we want to make sure that, you know, our offsprings are going to be surviving, and then after that, the, 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 the next generation. And so that means that good conservation is really equal good health. And what's also really important is not only about individuals or, or animal populations, but it's also the fact that we are sharing the same environment. And as you can see, this is just a, a few examples of the diversity of environment where uh, people and, and animals are also living together. Okay, so this is the reality. We have now, as I said before, you know, made a lot of modifications over the past 150, 200 years. Uh, 200 years. There is a lot of uh, destruction of natural habitat, a lot of overhunting and poaching of species for pelt, trophies, meat. And as a result, as you can see, you have a vast majority of mammal species, amphibian species, fish species, those are just three big families that I put there, but it's the same for a lot of other species that are now threatened in their natural habitat. But don't forget also that in the habitat, it's not only about the, plant, the, the animals, but the plants also. And it's incredible to think that 55% of the plants on the planet currently are threatened in their natural habitat. And when we talk about biodiversity, we need also to talk about biodiversity at large. I already mentioned the soil biodiversity, that's really important. But it's also the biodiversity that we put on our plate. And it's the biodiversity in terms of the different types of you know, potatoes that we grow, or garlic, or in, for animals is the difference, you know, breeds that are also extremely important. But unfortunately, we are losing them because we favored some uh, and we selected some commercial breeds that are really good, uh, productive, but uh, the problem is that we are only relying on a really, um, really dangerous and fragile uh, source of uh, food. So in terms of uh, when we talk about saving species and animal conservation, really this is what you have at the, the, the middle of this, uh, uh, the slide. This is the core. It's really to maintain 
genetic diversity. When you have a small population, to make sure that the small population is going to be able to multiply and then after that to thrive um, over the next generation, you need to make sure that you have a good genetic diversity. And we help that by helping, you know, natural breeding. Uh, we also have, you know, animal collections under human care. Uh, we have the possibility to reinforce or to sometimes reintroduce species in the natural habitat. So, of course, as you can see at the top, really the, the priority is, of course, and it's obvious, to protect natural habitats. This is really important. But on the other side of the spectrum, you have the understanding of the biology of species. And we, as you can see, it's a lot of different disciplines. But now, when we talk about the future of conservation biology, we are talking also now about new um, disciplines, like especially, you know, what we call bioeconomics and biopolitics. Of course, social science is not a new tool, but it's more and more integrated into this kind of effort to protect natural habitat. And for the basic understanding of the biology, we have new tools. We, took, we talked about uh, DNA sequencing, bioinformatics, biomathematics. This is extremely important. But uh, those new technologies also, uh, and those new approaches, I mean, they generate a lot of data. And now, we have to deal with a huge amount of data. You heard about the term big data, and this is changing the game for us, even for me as a research veterinarian, working in my lab or working with me, my animals, the way we conduct science is completely different because, of course, when you do research, you always formulate you know, a question. You also always ask a question, but now or even the question that you formulate or the hypothesis that you are stating, it's less and less intuitive. You need really the help of supercomputers really to better direct and to conduct your research. So I gave you this kind of uh, general um, views about uh, uh, conservation biology and what's, what's really trendy right now. And uh, since I am here to represent the Smithsonian Institution, I just want to, to take some examples from, from my own institution. So uh, a little bit of publicity, but we are the largest museum education and research complex on the planet and probably on the universe, I would say, because we still don't know if we have other uh, forms of life on, uh, uh, in the universe. But I would say that it's a, it's a pretty nice institution 19 museums, nine research centers, libraries, archives, and the National Zoo. Um, by the way, the museums are not all located on the national malls. We have also a research center in, uh, in, in Panama. We have also museums in, in the Design Museum, the Cooper, Cooper Ewitt Mu uh, Design Museum in, uh, in New York. We have huge collections. We have more than uh, 150 million artifacts, and we have as I say, libraries, a lot of books and, uh, and documents in our libraries. So this is, this is really a, a fantastic playground for, for research and for, for conservation biology also, because um, besides that, the Smithsonian uh, uh, has a, a really good advantage and a good assets in conservation biology. As I just mentioned, we have huge biological collections and they are not only collections, you know, in drawers, or they are also frozen collections, and we have also living collections, like the animals that we have at the research center in Front Royal, Virginia, and at the National Zoo. But we work also in, in different countries on different continents. I will give you some, some examples uh, after. What's also really nice is that we cover a lot of different disciplines, and we have scholars really hundreds of scholars also that are um, uh, working on different types of uh, uh, aspects. And um, uh, we also, of course, we have this powerful tool for outreach, communication, education, having a museum uh, on the mall, it's a fantastic window to, to communicate with people. But now more and more so we try to, to reach out to people online and uh, and this is also uh, uh, making a, a huge impact. And of course, we are not, well, we are proud of ourselves, but uh, we are not the only one. 
And uh, we, we like to have partners, and we partner with universities, non-governmental uh, organizations, and a lot of different uh, entities, nationally or internationally. But what's really interesting, again, um, is that we are able to, 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 to make, uh, to, to create a link between natural and cultural heritage within the same institution. I say that uh, we have also the National Zoo, and this is just a slide also to illustrate how there is a future also for zoos. And the future has changed. Enfin, it's, uh, it's uh, also based on a lot of changes in terms of uh, what, what's, uh, what's the definition of a zoo. Uh, you used to have, uh, for example, in Paris, la Ménagerie du Jardin des Plantes, that was uh, created you know, under Louis XIV. And at that time, it was just for entertainment and for Parisians to, to have the pleasure to see some exotic species. There was absolutely no mission of conservation or whatsoever. Then after that, the concept moved and, and, and changed a little bit and, and the zoos became more like uh, living museums. But now it's different. Now we have a lot of pressure. First of all, we have less and less uh, individuals in zoos because we cannot really uh, extract uh, wild animals from, from the wild to put them in zoos. This is really complex and we don't want to do that. We have a lot of pressure from animal activists and sometimes it's for, for good reasons because a lot of zoos are not necessarily up to the standards in terms of uh, welfare for, for the animals. And, uh, and now also zoos really want to become conservation centers. They want to have a role in really conservation biology. And they do have a role because they maintain you know, populations that can then have, of, of different animals that can then be uh, reintroduced in the wild. So I just uh, put this, uh, to s this slide again to, to, to remind you what, what are the different you know, aspects of animal conservation. But, uh, and I say that uh, there were a lot of disciplines in terms of uh, uh, understanding biology. And let me give you just a few examples of my discipline, which is animal reproduction. We, we in animal reproduction, uh, we try, first of all, to, to understand the basic traits of reproductive physiology in, in species. And uh, this is really hard because um, there is a lot of differences, of course, between species. And, um, and there are, lots of species. There are millions of species on the planet. And I can tell you that even within, you know, the mammal family, there are 5,500 species within the mammal family. And we have maybe properly described the reproduction of maybe 200 of them, which is not a lot. So there is still a lot of work to do. But we do that because, uh, first of all, we are curious and it's really important to know the diversity in terms of reproduction. But then after that, we use those, uh, this knowledge to help for natural breeding or for the animals that we have under our care. And it's a contribution to the maintenance of the gen genetic diversity and the sustainability of those population that we can then after that reintroduce. But then, um, <clears throat> since we're talking about the future of conservation biology, what's really also important is that when, when we know uh, a little bit more about the reproductive physiology of a species, then after that we can think of what we call the assisted reproductive techniques. And they are exactly the same that have been developed for, for human fertility, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, and embryo transfer. So this is something that's currently under development. And also tightly associated with that is the, what we call the genome resource banking. And I will give you a little bit more examples after that, but this is really the systematic sampling, preservation, and storage of biomaterials from those species that we can use after that for different purposes. But one of them is also, for example, when you freeze sperm, to do artificial insemination and to reinfuse genes from animals that are, you know, dead for a long time, but we have still their their uh, genome in uh, in the liquid nitrogen, and we can use that to participate again in the maintenance of the genetic diversity um, of the population. Oh, sorry. 
So, in terms of um, what's the current status of those um, assisted reproductive techniques for, for endangered species? Well, uh, we can report some success stories with artificial insemination, like um, on the left, top left, we have the, the pictures of the black-footed ferret. You do have black-footed ferret, I think, in, uh, in New Mexico now that have been reintroduced. But this is one of the success stories because from a few uh, a really s small number of animals, we were able to recreate a sustainable population using integrating artificial insemination and, and sperm freezing, and, and now to reintroduce animals. Giant panda is also a good example, and I will give you more, more details about that. And then after that, you see those pictures of beautiful species that we've been also able to produce using reproductive biotechnologies, but they are only anecdotal live births, and we cannot claim for all the other species that we are routinely using assisted reproductive techniques to maintain the genetic diversity of those populations. So there is still a lot of work to do. In terms of genome resource banking, I told you that it was like uh, the systematic sampling and preservation and storage of biomaterial, but the truth is that Right now, what we do the most is sperm samples, skin samples, blood samples, and DNA samples. So, talking about saving, you know, a species with uh, artificial insemination, giant panda is a good example. So, this is the ideal situation that you hope to see when, or oh, well, hope to see, well, it's really rare to see that in the wild, and I can tell you that it's pretty rare to see that also in uh, in captivity, because in zoo, because this happens only once a year. And, uh, but this is natural breeding, and this is what we would like to see with all the giant panda that we have under our care in, the, in different zoos. The problem is that most of the time, well, the male and the female, they don't really get uh, along together. There is no chemistry, and there is a lot of aggressivity. And the other situation is like my friends at the National Zoo, they really love each other, but they have absolutely no idea how to breed. <laughs> and uh, so on the, at the bottom, you see the female who's lying down flat like a pancake, and on the top, Mr. Tian Tian, who doesn't really know what to do. But they love each other. <laughs> so that's why we had to develop artificial insemination. So developing artificial insemination First of all, you need to monitor the females. And I said that, you know, it's a single estrus. It's a single ovulation that's going to happen sometimes. Usually it's uh, between March and May. So we monitor in the urine of the female, we monitor the estrogens. And when we see a rise of the estrogens, we know that the ovulation is imminent. And then after that, we also check, you know, the private part of uh, Madame Panda. And uh, when we know that the time is ripe, we perform the artificial insemination, either with fresh sperm or frozen sperm. And the technique that we are using at the National Zoo is the exact same technique that's used extensively in China. And, um, and then after that, of course, we monitor the, 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 the gestation of those, those animals. But uh, what's really interesting is that this is the result. Uh, right now, when we started really to develop the, 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 the techniques of artificial insemination in the panda, there were, in, for the population under human care, there were only 120 giant pandas. Most of them, they were in China. They had a lot of um, problems in terms of um, genetic diversity, nutrition, reproduction. It was a disaster. They were definitely going extinct, but we did a huge biomedical survey we did a lot of basic studies to try to really understand what was, you know, going wrong. And uh, we, then after that, we improved the, 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 the situation. And now, with the help, again, of the artificial insemination, we've been able to reach, you know, more than 500 individuals in captivity. I mean, it's that in, most of them, they are in China, but that also includes the, the animals that are in different zoos in the United States, in Europe, or, or in Asia. So now, what's really, really um, interesting, so it's not only you know, 500 individuals, but the genetic diversity is really good. And we are in the situation where we can 
now start to do some reintroduction of that species in the bamboo forest in central China, because we know for sure that the white population is really endangered. So this is one example, one species that has kind of a really important role in the ecosystem of the bamboo forest in central China. But um, unfortunately, you know, those efforts, you know, that are really uh, going slowly uh, are not enough. And we need, you know, there is an urgent need for more options. And again, that's part of the, 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 the future of uh, conservation biology is really well, to, to try to preserve, you know, different types of, uh, to increase, you know, the, 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 the diversity of biomaterials that are preserved but also is to try to, to store and to preserve for the long term those biomaterials at a minimal cost and also with really field-friendly techniques and um, again for, for the long term. And I will give you more example about that. This is kind of a project that we have uh, initiated for several years ago is that instead of using freezing temperature to store for the long term living biomaterials like sperm or eggs or embryos or cell lines, we are using desiccation. And we are kind of inspired by natural um, um, process that are used by microorganisms to resist really dry conditions but at room temperature. And we developed this, um, this uh, technique uh, where we are using trialose, which is a natural sugar produced by plants or some microorganisms or small um, yeah, microorganisms or small animals called the tardigrades. And they are able to completely uh, dry during the dry season. And then after that, they can and they synthesize these trialose inside the cell that really helps to stabilize any biochemical or it's not stabilized, but stop any biochemical or biophysical activity in the cells. And then after that, basically, you suspend life at ambient temperature for, for uh, a long period of time. Then after that, everything resumes when you have a rehydration. So what we've been doing is that well, we, we, different, we are using different tricks, but for the, for the desiccation, we are using a, uh, it's a, it's a microwave. It's, a, it's an industrial microwave system. We don't want to cook, of course, our, our cells or sperm or eggs, but uh, <clears throat> we are using pulses. After exposure to the triados, we are using pulses of uh, microwaves to dehydrate, to really remove the water from the samples. Then after that, we can uh, store them in uh, controlled humidity. Usually, they are stored in a small sealed uh, pocket. And uh, they can be stored at room temperature uh, for the long term, and we've been showing that after rehydration, uh, if we inject, sorry, oh, merde. sorry, if we inject those rehydrated, the, the picture that you have at the bottom is the injection of uh, rehydrated nucleus of an egg into a fresh cytoplasm, those reconstructed egg, they can then after that resume their normal development, they can be fertilized, they can produce embryos. So this is fantastic because this is really a proof of concept for us that we've been developing right now. It's only developed in the domestic cat as a, an experimental model. Uh, there is a huge interest from the National Institute of Health, of course, because they are thinking of using the same for uh, human fertility clinics that would save a lot of money to, dr to dry and keep everything at room temperature instead of using liquid nitrogen. So other really uh, cutting edge techniques, uh, well, we talked about now, it's not that new to use uh, genomics, but um, I would say that uh, what's really important is to use integrated biogenomics. And uh, what's really important is because, as you know, okay, we can read uh, DNA sequences, but for us, the most important is to really pair that with all the, the huge amount of phenotypical data that we have, you know, behavioral data, biological data that we collect on our animals, and to link that with their genome and to understand better 
really what part of the genomes are conditioning, for example, you know, resi resilience to some disease or sensitivity to stress or stuff like that or uh, subfertility. We can also now uh, non-invasively uh, 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 detect some, some, some markers, again, of some genetic disease and stuff like that. And of course, it's for us, it's a completely, it's a, it's a game changer to integrate biogenomics in the management of the population of animals because when we talk about maintaining genetic diversity, of course, we try to pair animals that are not related to each other. But now we are going to the next step. Not only, okay, we make sure that they are not related to each other, but then after that, that they also have parts of, in their genome that can be transmitted to the next generation and that are really, <coughs> I'm going to conf uh, really confer a lot of robustness to the, to the next generation. What's really important uh, to keep in mind also is not only about the DNA sequence, and we just talked about that before, the epigenome is really all this kind of a packaging of the DNA that's really important because it conditions the, 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 the access of the DNA by the transcription factor. And, uh, and that's what we were talking about this morning. Um, the, 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 the epigenetic is conditioning really the, the, the way you produce you know, uh, messenger RNA. So this is really important to understand also this epigenome because it's transmitted also from generation to generation. Uh, as I said, it, it controls a lot of the gene expression but it also helps to, uh, to, to manipulate also the, the, the gene expression. So for us, it's kind of uh, now, instead of, uh, of, we will talk about that a little bit later, about you know, editing the genome, where instead of, yeah, we can edit the genome, but also for, we can play also with the epigenome by trying to suppress or enhance some uh, transcription in the, in, in the genome. Another tool that's really important, and I'm jumping a little bit uh, uh, on a completely different area, but um, what's really important also, uh, it's the, the long-term monitoring of our natural habitat, and this is a tool also that's been initiate, initiated by the, the, the Smithsonian Institution. Now it's kind of an international collaboration, but uh, this is those, for example, just for forest environment is the different forest plots why is it changing without, sorry, the different forest plots that are um, monitored and uh, that's a really also important for the future of conservation biology because you need to understand how things are evolving, especially regeneration of the forest is really important to, to understand and to monitor. We do the same also for coastal environment. It's called the marine geo um, and um, we also now monitor the, the, the level of the ocean, the salinity, the pH, and of course the biodiversity in those coastal environments. So those are, I mean, this is what, this just to, to mention the fact that we need also to have this kind of uh, uh, large infrastructure to back up also to the, the work that we are doing in, uh, in, in the laboratory. So of course there are, other technologies now from, you know, as I said, from the nanoscale to the, to the petascale. And we talked about the microbiome, how important it is now to understand the microbiome for, for human. But uh, I've been also studying microbiome for um, a lot of different species and uh, not necessarily related to, um, to disease, but also the, the good, enfin, the microbiome that's kind of uh, regulating also fertility. And we have different projects uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in different species about that. This is a really emerging uh, uh, discipline. We have also the way to use nanotechnologies also to, to track uh, animal movement or just to measure basic physiological uh, tr uh, data like uh, heart rate or uh, glycemia or pH of the blood. And this is something that we can do now uh, non-invasively. And as I mentioned before, we are generating so many data now with uh, genomics, epigenomics, and, and microbiome that we need really strong computer support. And uh, we have uh, a collaboration with the Oak Ridge National Lab 
where they have a dedicated one of their supercomputer just to, um, to uh, conservation biology. Something also that uh, uh, we never really uh, talk about, but uh, often we talk about a lot about synthetic biology, and this is a little bit related to what uh, Andrea and I um, participated in uh, uh, last uh, summer at the Smithsonian. But uh, synthetic biology now is something that we cannot ignore because it's everywhere. It's basically a way to accelerate evolution and selection for not only microorganisms, but for plants, for um, also large animals. And it's incredible because those genetically engineered organisms are now for countries like the United States, Russia, China, really the highest priority and they invest a lot of money. And this is really something uh, comparable to the big data revolution. And uh, of course, for us, it's new ways to provide, as I just wrote here, food, uh, water, and also new way to, 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 to find treatments. But what's also really interesting, and I think we, we touched a little bit about that with the previous uh, presentation, it's, uh, it's, instead of, uh, it's a new approach to really understand basic biology. And instead of uh, um, looking through a microscope and, and, and doing dissection like it used to be, it was already super important, but now we are learning via building. So you have this kind of a possibility to change something in the genome and to see what's the, 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 the impact of that change. And that's really also completely changed uh, uh, the, the approach of understanding really basic uh, physiological mechanisms. So of course, uh, it's really controversial because synthetic biology we just wonder about how you know, biodiversity can really uh, take advantage of, uh, of uh, synthetic biology. Well, I think one of the first advantages is probably to fight you know, invasive species and to try to, to control overpopulations also, fight disease also in some, uh, in some species like uh, you know, the chytrid fungus in, uh, in frogs, uh, the bleaching of the, the, um, the, the coral reefs, I think solutions will come from synthetic biology, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And also, it's a way to, to restore genetic diversity way faster by, uh, again, uh, modifying the, the genome. But the problem is that um, <laughs> we, we, and we need to do some, some work about that, we have no real good uh, ideas about what's the interaction of those uh, engineered uh, organisms What's the, the interaction with the natural environment and with other, you know, um, animals or plants and the impact on, on biodiversity and what's the kind of the, the potential biosecurity issues? We need to study that because no matter what, it's coming and there is no way we can avoid it. So we really need to think of it. But I would say that, um, of course, as usual, we are always a little bit scared, especially, you know, when we touch the genome and genetically modified, you know, organisms, oh my God, I mean, <clears throat> I can tell you that coming from Europe, still right now, it's impossible, for example, to, to, eat, or dr to eat meat from cloned animals, for example, or to drink meat, it's, it's highly regulated. I know that whenever I go to the supermarket here, uh, when I buy milk, probably it's been produced by a cloned, you know, dairy cow, and it's not a problem. But still, I mean, it's highly controversial, and I think it's, uh, it's um, now a, a little bit uh, uh, comparable to, to, the, to the, 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 really the fear that we had when the first human baby was born by in vitro fertilization. I was, uh, we celebrated uh, <coughs> the, um, I don't know, she was born in 1978 and I was at her birthday. Uh, it was uh, not that long ago. So yes, she turned 40, right? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, slow. Okay, so she turned 40, um, uh, Louise Brown. Uh, she's uh, really nice. She had kids herself, by the way, without using uh, in vitro fertilization. But um, by the way, this is pretty interesting because uh, she's the first one to be born, you know. She's the first test tube baby. So she's like a, a really a curious species, curious animal. And she has this crazy story uh, about people calling her and 
trying to figure out if she's really, you know, normal or... And at that time, you know, in, uh, when we had this kind of uh, celebrate, it was a special symposium at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and uh, the pioneers for in vitro fertilization were there, and uh, they they were threatened, you know, by uh, again by uh, by people, and 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 people thought that we would be since we were able to do in vitro fertilization, we would be able to to cross human with monkeys and, and create kind of a monsters and stuff like that. But this is really crazy. Because that was, you know, 40 years ago. It's not that long ago. But now, you have millions of babies every year that are born using those techniques. So, it's now, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's normal. So, uh, I think my point is that, you know, that's going to be the same for synthetic biology. This is going to be part of our, you know, normal life and we're not going to be too scared. So, of course, when we talk about you know future of conservation and uh, technologies, <coughs> as I said before, it's really important to think of translations and not to only talk about the crazy scientist in his lab. And uh, in uh, in in uh, human uh, reproductive, of, uh, in human medicine, there is this term of you know translational medicine, basically trying to make sure that what's produced at the lab bench is really uh, applied to, to the bedside for the patient. And for us, what we have to do, uh, we have to do um, um, some, some, some work, some communication work and outreach because we need to make sure that there is no gap between the technologies that we are using and uh, the conservation biology and, and the field studies. Uh, and as I just say here is that because again, uh, when you see for the for the for the pub, general public, I think it's uh, it's when you see those dramatic pictures of uh, poaching in northern Africa or dead amphibians. I mean, it's uh, emotionally it's really strong, and you just wonder. But hold on a second, why? Why? What's going to be the impact of your fancy uh, technique of uh, drying, you know, eggs and preserving everything at room temperature? When you see, you know, this happening, and that's true. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's it's a problem. But everything has to progress, you know, in parallel. And it's not because you see those uh, dramatic pictures that you have to stop all the research in the lab. Of course, we are hardly, we are sorry, uh, extensively uh, working on trying to solve those problems at the same time. But uh, but this is also important to 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 find, you know, new options, as I said, for conservation biology. Interdisciplinary approaches are really important. Uh, I work uh, mainly with a lot of uh, engineers that are helping me to develop, for example, those uh, microwave, uh, special microwaves. We need also to make sure that information is easily accessible to people who are not necessarily specialists in technologies or conservation, but everything needs to be accessible and, and open. And of course, there is a huge part is training of you know the next generation of conservationists or the next generation of biologists, and we need to make sure that this next generation has a really keen and and a really uh, sharp understanding of uh, you know different disciplines. And we don't want to have you know uh, people who are only you know trained in ecology. Those people, they need also to understand the value of biobanking, for example. Bioinformaticians now, they need also to be really um, savvy in terms of uh, basic physiology. And I think it's going to help also to, 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 to make progress way faster. So actually, the, it's not the future of conservation biology, but I think the future is really conservation biology because, as I said, good conservation is get equal good health, even for human population. So we still have a lot of work to do. 90% uh, of biodiversity remains undiscovered on the planet. This is crazy. We have a, we estimate that there there are about maybe 8 million species on the planet total, and we know only 10% well, of them. Um, we have to address new challenges, as I explained, you know, the, this amphibian crisis, and uh, this is also extremely important to, uh, to, to take care of those problems. Uh, we need, of course, always, it's not only 
as you know, uh, you cannot you solve only the problem as long as you have a good understanding of what's going on. So basic research is really important. And this is something also that we have to, this is sometimes a, a message that's a little bit difficult to convey to the general public because sometimes, you know, it's a little bit boring to talk about basic science, but this is really, really important. And, uh, and as I said here also, is to make sure that whatever we, we, we find is really then integrated into conservation efforts. And again, work at the intersection of, uh, of disciplines. But then, <clears throat> what's also really important to, to me in terms of conservation biology is that we, we cannot ignore the human dimension. Of course, well, we, 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 we know that humans are uh, impacting a lot biodiversity and the environment, but uh, <clears throat> uh, the truth is that uh, while we have more and more people living on the planet, and we need to find a solution. And there are definitely solutions. We need to be really optimistic. And we need to consider ourselves as kind of a good gardeners of our planet. And uh, this kind of um, concept of uh, having really protected areas, it used to be really uh, pr a protected area. And it's still the, the, the case in some, some places. But uh, it's exclusion from uh, any human population. But that doesn't necessarily make sense because, well, population are growing and people need to have, you know, to do some agriculture, they need to produce food. So this, this human factor has to be really integrated in all the different efforts that we are uh, doing in the field. And this is possible to do. And also what we need to understand, we need to be patient uh, because uh, those efforts in terms of conservation biology they take a lot of time, and probably the things that are uh, developed right now in our laboratory will be applied, you know, maybe in 25 years from now in the field, and then who will see the results? It will be, you know, our kids or our grandkids. So it's a really transgenerational effort, and we have to accept that maybe, you know, we, we will not see the results of our efforts right now during our, our time on the planet, but anyway, this is... Um, this is really important. So, just to finish, um, since we are here to celebrate biodiversity, I want to talk about, just quickly, about an area of the planet that it's really uh, dear to myself because I've been working there, I live there, and it's the Sahara. And, uh, you know, this is interesting because when you talk about biodiversity, you usually think of, you know, tropical forests, rainforests with a lot of animals. And uh, when you hear, you know, uh, soundtracks of biodiversity, it's always the jungle and stuff like that. But uh, biodiversity, you know, exists also <laughs> in other parts of the, the planet. And the Sahara is a good example. It's the world, world uh, largest uh, desert. Desert or desert? I always... Uh, desert. 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 Sorry, it's not desert. Okay, <laughs> desert. And it's bordered by, by the Sahel. So, you know, usually we think that, well, the Sahara is like here, you know, at the bottom, bottom right, it's only those sand dunes. But this is not true because you have different types of uh, habitats. And, um, of course, you have a lot of biodiversity, but you have those beautiful antelopes. The, this is a picture uh, taken in Niger where you have the last remaining population of Adax. So this is a fantastic species, highly adapted to high temperature, and uh, they can survive, they, they cross like that, those huge areas without drinking for several weeks or months. They just get the water from the small plants that they can find, you know, at night. So this is, uh, this is uh, beautiful because this is a biodiversity that uh, we tend a little bit to, to forget. Uh, we are also extensively working on that species, the scimitar on the oryx, that has been completely extinct in the wild, but now we are reintroducing them in, uh, in Chad. And uh, so what's really important is that by doing this uh, protection and, and reintroduction of those species and maintaining the biodiversity also in, in the Sahara, we are restoring also a cultural heritage. And here those are uh, just petroglyphs and those pictures that I took in uh, south of Algeria. It's just to remind that 
Well, the Sahara used to be a really completely different ecosystem. Uh, there were probably forests and, uh, and there were a lot of uh, biodiversity. But what's really interesting is that right now, you still have um, in traditional uh, stories, in poetry, um, kids. I remember uh, the kids singing songs about animals that are traditionally living in the environment, but they've never, been, they've never seen those animals. So this is crazy. So, but now they are so lucky because they see you know, those antelopes back you know, in, the, in the grassland, and they can understand, oh, yes, yeah, so this is the antelope that we are you know, uh, really celebrating in our songs and stuff like that. So this is, to me, a uh, 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 small satisfaction trying to, to, to think that doing that, we are really, again, bridging you know, um, uh, cultural and, and natural uh, heritage. So I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, to remind you that uh, we need to be optimistic. And uh, last, last year, we organized uh, during Earth Day uh, the Earth Optimism Summit at the Smithsonian with a lot of different partners. Uh, this year, it's going to be different. We're not going to be doing a huge summit, but we are doing like a, a, a huge event on, uh, on Twitter. There will be uh, discussion forums, everything online, and it's going to start uh, on Monday, April 16. It's going to last until the, the end of uh, Earth Day. Thank you for your attention.